I hope this finds you doing well, and uh, we do have some announcements before we get started. Uh, this Sunday, after worship, I'm going to invite uh, the members of the board and, and anyone else who wants to come in to uh, come into the sanctuary of the church. And we have set up um, some fans at the doors of, of the sanctuaries to pull air into the sanctuary and then pull it, push it out the back so that we have constant airflow. And um, we believe that by doing that and then asking those who can to please wear masks, understanding that not everyone one can that we will be looking at uh, having worship inside the sanctuary again as of the first Sunday of July I realize that um, this is a, a challenge for all of us that as we continue to watch the numbers of cases continue to rise and the, the heat continues to, to increase as well, literally. It's, it's getting hot outside. And, and so I, I believe that uh, if this works, this will be the way for us to uh, continue to safely gather and gather inside the church. So, uh, the reading this day is not from the Lord's Prayer. We're taking a bit of a detour to, to finish up some of the things that we started talking about last Sunday. Last Sunday, we looked at what does it mean when Jesus asks us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. To show you something of what it looks like, at least for me, to write a sermon, uh, when I start writing a sermon, Monday or Tuesday, I start writing and thinking and pondering and praying and studying, and um, everything eventually starts coming together on these very big sheets of paper that look like this. And I usually fill up one big sheet of paper per sermon, and uh, this is everything that I didn't say last week start talking about thy kingdom come and there's a lot going on there and so uh this is the, as i said this is what didn't wasn't in the sermon last week and so uh we can think of this as sort of part two uh continuing uh thinking about the kingdom and what we're going to do is look at a, a moment when the kingdom comes up in discussion between jesus and those who are trying to trick him and mess with him so we read this day from Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. They left him and went away. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. To pray thy will be done is to offer ourselves, to redirect ourselves continuously towards God's kingdom. This is what God's kingdom is. It, it's a way of life when all people are doing all things in line with God's will. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We get to, right? Because we as people who follow Jesus have lined ourselves up with what God desires. To pray this prayer is to be constantly reminding ourselves that we are headed towards an entirely different way of life. We're headed that way together. We are headed towards a future when and where God's goodness is what will be the given. That will be the standard. That will be the excellence of, of what we will live. To pray this prayer then the gather then gather for communion is to have a foretaste of this meal, of this feast that is to come. Now, before we move on to the rest of the prayer that, that Jesus teaches, it, it struck me that 
we really needed to stop and to keep on thinking and some, spend some time thinking about how Jesus responds to when he is challenged about uh, the nature of the kingdom, the nature of the relationship between the kingdom of God and the kingdom that uh, Jesus and his disciples were living in right then and there. You see, the, the people of Jesus' day also were living in this, this moment between the, the kingdom that they had been promised the son of David will rule on the throne again in Israel, and they were holding on to that even while they were enduring living under the, the kingdom, the power, the politics of the Roman Empire. And so it was a complicated situation. How did they? How were they going to handle that? How did they navigate this situation? Um, it's a topic that was debated and hashed over often. They had to work with Rome to a degree, as that's what they had right there, and they had to hold on to where they were headed, and so as the people of God. And so this group of community leaders of the day were attempting to sort of entrap Jesus as he is there in Jerusalem, and they're wanting to, to pin him down in a way that will get him in trouble. They're asking him about this hot button issue. Should we pay taxes or not? Should I, pay, and by paying taxes, do I support this government? This politics? It is a very loaded question. If Jesus answers yes, pay the, pay the taxes, then he can be seen as denying the promise that God, God has made to God's people that they're headed towards a kingdom. How can you be paying taxes to support this kingdom when we're headed towards God's kingdom? But if he answers no, you should not pay taxes, then he can be arrested by, that, by the Roman Empire. He can be arrested as uh, in causing sedition, promoting sedition and revolt. And so Jesus looks at them and calls them out as being hypocrites. He asks them, let me see the coin that is used to pay this tax. And he tells them, you know, this is the emperor's coin, this is the emperor's head, right? Give it to the government. It's the government, that this Roman government, that makes these coins. Give it to the government. Give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So, this is excellent advice, saying, Jesus, smart guy. How do we start to think about it today? How do we understand that today as we live in a different time under a very different politics? We don't live as a subjugated people under the control of a foreign power. We live in a representative democracy, right? We are still a people that's pointed towards, praying towards, walking towards the kingdom which is to come, a goal that has not changed, a destination that has not changed. The path we're traveling looks different than it did to the people of the first century. And so I think what we can say to start to figure this out is that, just as it was in the first century, is as it is today. The state builds the roads for its citizens, and people that follow Jesus follow him and have their lives transformed as it being his disciples. And to hold those two as two distinct uh, realities matters. All right, the state builds the roads for its citizens. People that follow Jesus are his disciples and have their entire lives transformed in doing so. Keeping that clear seems to be the best way that I can think of to keep the role of the state and the role of the church in perspective. Right? No matter what the politics of the day are, no matter what the nation or the kingdom is, it is always being discussed in comparison to the kingdom of God. And there's only one politics that will be eternal, and that's God's kingdom. And so, in comparison to that, there are things that the state can accomplish that no one else will do. There are things the state does for its citizens that are good things for its citizens, right? No one will build the roads other than the government, and so that's what the government does for its citizens. No one will build schools for, for primary education other than a government. So a government, that's what the government does. No one will deal with putting together emergency services and 911, so that's what, no one else is gonna do that, so that's what the government does for the good of its citizens. All right, the state does what is needed for the good of its citizens and gathers taxes to cover those costs. And so what the state is doing, what the local government of this day is doing, are, is an inherently humble set of tasks. All right, the state is, is building the, the framework upon which everyone, everyone else can then work and excel and do more. Right, but at its very core, this, a state, a government, 
does humble work, right? It does the work that no one else will do and that is needed for the good of its citizens, right? I, I don't think anyone else would voluntarily get into the sewer line business. I sure am glad that the state does it. I appreciate it greatly. Right? So that's what the state does. The state does the, the tasks that are important for the good of the citizens. What the state cannot do is that the state cannot grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? The, the state cannot cause people to become full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Like those are the, that's the fruit of the spirit, and that's you're not going to find that as something that the state can do. The state can provide the plumbing for the church, but it takes the people gathered together before God, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit for people to become gentle. The state can teach children how to add and subtract, but it takes following Jesus to be filled with joy and peace. The state can bring to bear the full power of the law and judge someone to have committed a crime, but it takes praying, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, forgive, who sin against us, for people to learn to forgive and reconcile. The state can serve the, the common good of all of its citizens, but the church is the place that we look towards the eternal good, the kingdom that we're praying for. And so the state does what matters today, and then the church is looking at today and into eternity. Uh, today matters. I, I value having ra roads that are paved, schools that are well run, justice to be fairly administered. And because that is taken care of, we then have the opportunity to do what we're doing right now, which is gathering and worship, to be able to pray towards the kingdom of God that is to come. One of the people who helped me make this distinction and see clearly this, this difference is Martin Luther King Jr. I, I took time uh, during seminary to study Martin Luther King Jr. as one of the most important preachers and civil rights leaders in American history. And, and I came across a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. in my studies that sort of gets at this, this sense of what the state can do and what the church can do. Martin Luther King Jr. said, it may be true that the law cannot make a man Man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. I think he's getting at something there, right? That seems to get at what we're talking about. The law, the state, it cannot make people love each other. Right? It takes the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It takes following Jesus to become people to learn that, to love our neighbors, right? That, that is what it takes. It takes following Jesus Christ to learn to love and to love well. But what the state can do is it can stop lynchings. And that's an excellent start. It's an excellent, humble goal. Stop killing people, right? It was in studying his life and ministry that I noticed what happened to Martin Luther King Jr. over the years, right? At the first part, if you look across the ministry and life of Martin Luther King Jr., in the first part of the 60s, he spent his time focused on civil rights. That's kind of where he is best known, is those first years as a civil rights leader. And that's uh, focusing on what can the state do? What should the state do? What does the state need to do to serve its citizens? What happened over time, though, is Martin Luther King Jr. moved from focusing so much on the role of the state to start calling more on what the church is called to be. Right. Martin Luther King Jr. came out against the Vietnam War long before it was popular to do so. He did this because he's a preacher, and he preaches the good news of the Prince of Peace. And this did not go over well. Like, he got pushed. He, people expected him to stay focused on civil rights. I mean, so, that, that's what you're supposed to do, uh, King. Like, that's your, that's your gig. That, that's what you're focused on. And, and yes, that's what he had been focused on, but he was moving on. They, the, the state can do a certain amount of good, right? civil rights for all of its citizens, but now there's something that Christians need to be able to say. And as the church, we need to be able to say, you know, I follow Jesus Christ, and I proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the good news of reconciliation. And, and he, this is what happens across the 60s, as Martin Luther King Jr. moves from being someone who is focused on what the state needs to do for all of its citizens, to then focusing on what is the call of Jesus Christ on Jesus Christ's disciples. And there are two different things. Watching how Martin Luther King Jr. did this helped me to clarify for myself how to make sense 
of what Jesus says when he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And so what that helps me see today is that we live in a nation, America, this, our, this politics, this kingdom, this government of America, and not every American is a Christian, which is probably not a surprise to anyone, right? America may have been founded as a nation that was predominantly Christian, but that has ceased to be the case. And so we as Christians in America... We follow Jesus, and Jesus sends us out to love our neighbor. Right? That's the second greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. And notice, Jesus doesn't say that the second greatest commandment is to go love everyone who believes the same thing you believe. Right? Jesus doesn't say, go love other disciples of Jesus like you love yourself. Jesus says, go love your neighbor. And our neighbors today are our citizens, the fellow citizens. Right? That's part of, of, so to be an American and to be a Christian is to understand that to love our fellow citizens is to love our fellow neighbors. That, that is something that Jesus has told us to do. Right? And to, for, for all of us, that means paying our taxes so that we pay for the things like the streets, the roads, the, the infrastructure, the schools, the emergency services, so that we are building a baseline that serves all of our citizens, that serves all of our neighbors. Right? And then for some of us, all of us pay taxes. All, then for some of us, that means means taking a role in the government to use those taxes for the common good. And I think it's a good thing that Christians step forward to serve as teachers, as politicians, as all the various other roles that, that Christians step forward to take to work for the good of our communities. And I would argue that Christians, as people who are sent to love their neighbors, are, are the people who are best prepared to serve all citizens. The key is, is to keep straight that the role of the state is different than the role of the church. The role of the state is to do the humble things, roads, education, emergency services, common defense, right? The role of the state is to do the things that are important to all citizens, that the state cannot grow the fruit of the spirit, and that most importantly, the state cannot make disciples of Jesus. That's not the state's job. That's our job. That's our task. That's all our calling. And so, yes, we give to the government what it is that is, is the government's to have. We support the service to all citizens for the common good. And we pray and support those who are part of serving the common good. And for those of us who go forth to serve the common good, to serve all citizens, that is wonderful. And I hope that we continue to do this. And it is a blessing. I hope we continue to be, as a church, a blessing that we send people out to serve the common good common good. And then as the church, we gather to proclaim something better than the common good. The common good is good, but what we, we proclaim is better. It is eternal. It is perfect. For we gather to proclaim the kingdom of God, a, a citizenship in the kingdom that is freely offered, open to all, and is not good just for this life, but is, li is good also in the life that is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as people who live in between, in this time when you have told us the kingdom is coming and we're not that yet there, we pray for patience. We pay, pray for you to guide us as we discern how to serve our fellow citizens, how do we serve our, our neighbors, doing as, as you have commanded us to love our, our neighbors as ourselves, doing what we can for the common good, even as we journey towards the eternal good, towards your kingdom. And so we pray, especially for those who are uh, selflessly serving the common good, those who are in emergency services, those doctors, teachers, those uh, utility workers, the people who keep the, the power on. Uh, we, we pray for all of these folk who are doing what they can for us, uh, at the, for the common good. We pray for their safety. We pray for those who are continuing to grapple with sickness in these days, whether it's the sickness of, of what just happens during life or the the continuing challenge of this virus uh, as more and more people continue to be sickened by it, uh, especially in, in Texas and in Florida. We pray for the people of these states. We pray for the people of our states that they might leave
lead wisely that we might be able to discern how we might be, uh, be able to endure and, and come through this. We pray for all those who are searching for a cure, all those who are searching for a vaccine, that their, their research might be proven and validated and be able to uh, work again for the common good quickly. We pray for all these things as we pray the prayer that you tossed to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I hope that uh, you all have a wonderful week. I hope that I am able to see some people in these pews in the first Sunday of July, this next Sunday. And I uh, hope to see you all soon.